Hi everybody, I'm Kathy Smirla. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at The Vineyard. We are so glad you're joining us today, whether you're joining us online or on site here in the building, we're glad you're having church with us today. And if you're new, we're especially glad that you're here. I hope uh, that you get connected. We really want you to get connected. There's a couple ways to do that. You can text the word NEW, N-E-W, to the number right here on your screen. You can fill out a connect card, whether that is online or in the building, you can find a connect card and we'd love for you to do that. And when you do that, you get invited to things like the Newcomers Cookout, which is actually this Sunday at 1 p.m. right after the 1130 service. So we'd love for you to come there. You can meet some of the staff. Pastor Mark will be there. You can ask any questions you might have about the vineyard. If there's still time to sign up, go to thevineyard.info. If it's 1130 right now, just head on down after the service is over. Hey, Lake Blast is only three weeks away, and a huge, probably the most exciting part of Lake Blast is the baptisms that happen. The word celebration comes to my mind when I think about baptism, because really we're celebrating the things that God has done in our lives. So whether it's you've committed to Jesus for the first time this year, or you've recommitted or made some significant spiritual growth step in the last six months or so, baptism is a great way to express that. It's a great next step. So we have baptism classes coming up. You can ask questions when you're there, find out all about what it baptism entails here at the Vineyard Church. So you can check your program or go to the vineyard.info and find a class that works for you. One last thing for me, today after every service, we are having exploring meetings about the possibility of starting a community center in the Hillis Hands neighborhood, which is just five minutes away from the vineyard. We're excited about this possibility. And if you would like to find out more, please come to the chapel after the service. We'll get you some great information, share some of the vision for that outreach center, and even give you an opportunity to sign up to be involved. Before I go, we have activity bags for the kids who are in the room. If that's helpful to you, just flag down an usher and they'll make sure you get one of those. And if your child gets a little restless, you're welcome to go to the atrium. You can uh, still watch and listen to the message out there. Also, if you're online, what would be super helpful is if you would share this service. Thanks, everybody. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Huffman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. It's good to see everybody. Hello, everyone. Also want to welcome those who are joining us online. I know we have a good crew joining us online. So many of you know we're about ready to move into a time of worship, right? Do we need to stretch a little bit before worship? Are we doing okay? Everybody at home is probably like, oh, yeah, I need a little stretch. So here's, here's generally what happens before we move into worship. Somebody comes up here on the platform. We, we talk about worship from Scripture, or we tell you why you should worship and try to get you motivated. So yesterday in my office, before last night's service, I was, uh, I was flipping through, sort of praying, God, what do you want me to do? And I got nothing. Is that super helpful? No. So I, I literally, I got nothing while I was sitting there. And so I was like, God, what do you want me to do? And he, it, this is what I thought I sensed him say. Why don't you let me do the welcome? And so I thought that's kind of, that could be impactful. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to let God do the welcome. I'm going to do that. Uh, why don't you stand? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask him a question. This might sound weird, but we're actually, I'm just going to pray. And here's what your role in this prayer is. Your role is to listen. That's it. So there's going to be a little bit of silence after I pray and you're just going to listen. I'm just going to ask God a question and to speak to us. So here's, here's what we're going to do. So God, we come before you and we need to hear from you, God. And so I ask if you could Tell each one of us uniquely, why are we here to worship? Why today? I'll give you just a second. Some of you are, it's that first thought that crosses your mind. Don't discount that. That, could, that might be God. As we're in this posture of prayer, just how amazing is it that the God of the universe is talking to hundreds of people 
uniquely this morning. So God, we thank you as you reveal yourself to us this morning, as you share with us why we come to worship. For me, God, what I heard is, um, I just sense in the, in the big beginning of the book of Acts, people came together to worship. They came together as community to worship you because of what you were doing. And so God, we thank you for speaking to, speaking to us this morning. We thank you for opening up worship to you this morning. You deserve it, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God and all my to show you like Lord will you just show us will you remind us of the times that you've been with us that you've been faithful that you've been good to us yeah we just create some space to remember just saying thank you and praying out loud, feel free. Feel free to thank the Lord verbally. So just thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you've been faithful. You're so worthy of our praise, of our affection, Jesus. together. Let's sing all my life.
Because now his end in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion. You're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. Let's sing you reign. There's a lot of people right now that are struggling to believe this. So can we sing this out? We're going to sing it again. We're going to sing, You reign above it all in faith. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. And over the universe and over every art, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign. One more time, you reign. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Yeah.
So Jesus, you reign above it all. Every nation, every town, every person, every problem, every issue, you reign above it all. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That was a powerful time of worship. Thank you so much. I don't know how you transition out of this, but here's what we're going to try to do. You get 10, 15 seconds to be nice to those around you while maintaining social distance. Online, online folks, create community online. Say hello, what you're doing, what you're dressed as. Do that, and we'll move into time here in a minute for the message. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor at the church. Good to be with you this morning. Yeah, that's nice of you. I also want to say hi to folks at Grape Road and those online. Uh, we're going to get into the talk for the day in just a moment. If, if you want to be ahead of the curve, you can um, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. You can do that on your phone or got a paper Bible with you. But I want to take a couple minutes and uh, do a couple pastoral announcements about services that are coming up. A lot of it has to do with, uh, did you, have you guys heard of the pandemic? It's heard about that? Yeah. So anyway, we continue to try to figure out how to do great ministry in the midst of that and social distance and trying to be safe, but keep offering people Christ, all those things. There are a lot of important, did you know there are a lot of important things in life? There's just a lot of important things. So we're trying to figure that out. And I want to uh, share some new on-site church opportunities that we're putting together starting next weekend. So, up on the screen, these are, these are the services that we will be offering. A lot of it is staying the same. At Jackson Road, we're going to still have our three service times. Um, at Grape Road, you'll notice we're adding an 8.30 a.m. service time next weekend. Uh, to make sure that there's services uh, that people can have social distance in the midst. So we're adding a service there. And a couple important things. We're adding two of our multiple services, right? We're going to have all these different services. But two of them are going to be mask-required services because we have a lot of people that uh, will would feel more comfortable coming back to church if they knew everyone in the room was wearing a mask. So... Those services are 8.30 at Grape Road is a mask required service. And then at Jackson Road, we're going to do a service in the chapel at 11.30 that's a mask required service. So those of you online that have been waiting for uh, coming back and getting in a little more significant community, please check those two opportunities out. And can you all just keep praying for us as we try to figure out how to do this well, um, it's just still a fluid situation. We were still having conversations yesterday about the possibility of adding more masked services and all, all mask. It's just, it's complicated, is it not? At least it feels a little complicated. One other word of encouragement or challenge if you're a follower of Jesus and you have a prayer life, pray for not just the leadership of the church, but will you pray for our community leaders and the leaders in the county and the leaders in the state and the leaders in the nation because they're trying to navigate a very complex situation. I know most of us, right, we think, well, I know what everybody should do, right? You all have, the, I, we all know. But the reality of the multi-layer effect of every different decision, it really impacts us in all kinds of different ways. And I think that's one of the reasons that God calls his people to pray for those in authority over us, because they have got to be making very difficult decisions. Um, 
dun, 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 the chat room. And as we add these different service opportunities, we need volunteers to help pull them off. So especially those of you that may come back, if we have the face mask required services, we need help with those services. We need people that will greet people or help with the worship or help with the technical stuff. Uh, if we don't have volunteers, we can't pull off all the services. One special request is if you could, if you can play an instrument, this is my instrument. I'm miming an instrument <laughs> right now. Especially if you could play acoustic guitar, we can go a long way with with some acoustic guitar players, we're going to offer live worship. The plan is to offer live worship in both auditoriums, in the chapel, so it's not just going to be watching the screen. So can anybody play guitar? Fake it. Anybody, anybody ever want to play guitar? Okay, we need you now to learn this week how to play guitar. Those of you who say, well, I used to play guitar, that counts. Uh, and if you're curious about playing guitar in worship, by the way, uh, many, many instruments are needed, but I don't know, I just keep standing like this, so we'll talk about guitars. Uh, we've got a couple workshops. Go to the vineyard.info, and it's how to develop as a worship, as a guitar, worship, worship guitar player person. Whether you're just getting started or whether you want to hone your skills, Zechariah Good is going to be teaching some classes in the next couple weeks. Great things to do there. Let's pray. Uh, we're going to pray about the offering, but we're also just going to pray uh, for leaders making decisions. Father, we pray for our, the leaders in our community. We pray for the leaders in our uh, county and in our state and uh, even across our nation. And we as a group of, I don't know, two, three, four, five hundred people connecting right now, we ask God, that you would raise the voice of those that are making decisions that are in line with your heart. Give them favor and open the doors so that our country might be uh, filled with your presence and your wisdom as we navigate difficult days. I also pray, God, that you would shut the mouths of people that are not helpful. Um, we can't do it. <laughs> And so there are probably all kinds of voices in different places that, that maybe, Father, you cringe like sometimes we cringe. And I ask God that you would close the, close the doors that are really evil. Uh, we pray, Father, for your intervention in the midst of uh, the sickness. Will you bring healing and help and wholeness? It's just a situation that we admit, most of us admit, we are not in control of so many things that we think we are. And we ask you to bring your control into it. And uh, as usual, we pray for the offering, that our offering to you financially this week would be a blessing, that it would make you feel loved, and uh, that you would do great ministry things with the money that comes into this church. In Jesus' name, amen. The longest pastoral announcement ever at the Vineyard. You just sat through it. Matthew chapter 13, here's our opening question. How hard would I hunt for hidden treasure? Pause. Think about that. How hard would you hunt if you were aware of hidden treasure? Uh, did you hear about the forest fen treasure hunt? Have you heard of this thing? This guy, the forest fen treasure hunt. I'll tell you about it. It's okay if you haven't heard about it. Forest fen. Doesn't he sound like a cartoon character or something? <laughs> He's an eccentric art dealer from Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 2010, 10 years ago, he hid a bronze treasure box in the Rocky Mountains. He did two things in 2010. He hid this treasure box with some stuff in it, and he self-published a book that included clues to where he had hidden the treasure. Side note, inside the box... Estimated value of the artifacts and treasure things, a million dollars. Some of you just started to pay attention. So this is not, a, this is like a, all right? Um, so here's some of the details of what, have, of what has happened over the last 10 years. 350,000 people have been looking for the box. A number of people left full-time employment 
to look for the box. I don't know, it's a million bucks. So somebody's like, okay, well, I really think I know her anyway. Five people died looking for the box. They fell off the edge of the Rocky Mountains or, yeah. Just a side note for those of you who are thinking about skipping the rest of church and going to look for the box, uh, they found it in June and the, that's when the national news caught more of the story. Uh, anyway, it helps with the idea of the question, how hard would I hunt for hidden treasure? And for me, the answer is, it depends on what the treasure is. I'm really not interested in traipsing around the Rocky Mountains looking for something like that. But I will spend way too much time trying to find a sweet deal at TJ Maxx. <laughs> like stupid amount of time, you know, to save $6 on a pack of t-shirts. I cannot believe how much time I will do that. Or uh, I, like to, I like the water, I like to swim, I like to snorkel, and we vacation up in Michigan we're in a lake, at a lake that is really pretty clear, and so I'll spend crazy amounts of time snorkeling around and diving down in this lake looking for what I call, we actually call it, treasure. Like I'll find a, an old pair of sunglasses that fell off of some fisherman's, <laughs> and I'll, I'm like coming to the top like, oh, I found treasure, sunglasses and stupid stuff old fishing lures or whatever. I'll spend a lot of time looking for that. Some of you probably have things that you will hunt for. Uh, you're, you're looking for Mr. Right or some babelicious date. Some of you are like, oh yeah, I'm looking for that. And you spend a lot of time hunting. Babelicious. I always wanted to use the word. I used it. <laughs> babelicious. Is that a word? All right. It is now. You're hunting for your babelicious date. Um, what else do we hunt for? Some of us will spend a lot of time reading lots of books on uh, financial success, trying to figure out how to make money. Or well, There are things that we will hunt for. But I want to transition and ask the question, the same question basically of you spiritually. How willing are you to hunt for godly treasures, treasures from God, spiritual valuables that will and can greatly impact our lives. It's part of a great Christian life takes hunting. A few verses, Jeremiah 29, 11. You may have heard of this verse because it talks about what you could describe as treasure it says, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. That kind of sounds like a treasure. But sometimes we miss going on to two verses later where it talks about what it takes to find the treasure. And it says, you will seek me and find me when you, when you seek me with all your heart. That sounds like hunting. In Luke chapter 8, it mentions knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. Secrets, not if, if it's a secret, not everybody knows about it. And you may have to look a little harder. Because it's a secret. In Matthew 7, 7, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. So... Hold those thoughts. We're in this series called Kingdom Stories. And we're looking at teaching stories, parables. Most of them are parables or word pictures that Jesus used to help us understand how do spiritual things work? What's the kingdom of God like? And he'd use, he'll use stories like, you know, the kingdom of God is like a farmer going out to plant seeds in the field. Or the kingdom of God uh, is like... Uh, building a house on a good foundation. Or the kingdom of God is like uh, a, a man going to his neighbor and wanting bread. And he's got all these pictures that help us understand how God works and how the kingdom of God works. And today, our parable is the parable of the hidden treasure. It also... Uh, 
includes a parable of the great pearl. And so we're going to read it, Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. It's just a couple of verses. Let's read them again. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The title of the talk is Jackpot Christians. It's a parable of the hidden treasures. And I'm going to talk, or we're going to explore uh, what it would take to increase the chances of us finding some spiritual, spiritually valuable uh, uh, understanding or experience in our life. And before I give you some ideas from the text, would you pause and think of an area of your life that you would really benefit from a valuable discovery? might be an area of your life that's not working so well, or you just want more of something, but you would love to like find a box that had these nuggets that would help you in that area. For me, I thought about um, uh, wisdom just for me. I'm trying to figure out how to be a good leader in the midst of all the COVID crazy. And I'm not sure how to do it. I really am, you know, and so for several weeks, probably a couple months, we've been like, God, you got to help us figure this out. So I'm hoping to, to find this box filled with the right wisdom to do it. But for you, it could be something else. It might be some relational thing. It could be just a real practical, how to, how to do finances or friends. Or... But with some of those things in mind, let's pray, and then I'll give you some ideas on how to find spiritual treasure. Father, it would be great if tomorrow was a better day because you showed us how to find spiritual valuables today. Uh, this kind of a talk, these kinds of discoveries can help us immensely in our future. So will you take over and teach us today? Whether we're on site, whether we're online, I pray for those online, that in the midst of uh, potentially greater distractions as they sit around on their couch or whatever, God, will you talk to them, talk to us, talk to those of us at Grape Road. Help us be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Two ideas that will help us find spiritual treasure. The first one from the text is spiritual treasure takes some digging around. Just some digging around. This is an extension of the initial thought of you got to hunt a little bit or a lot. It, notice in verse 44, it says the kingdom of heaven is like, and there's a word that we want to emphasize. It's like treasure hidden in a field. It's, the treasure is hidden. Um, the word there for hidden means to hide, to conceal. It means to make it secret, to quietly withdraw. So what I imagine in this field, in this picture where Jesus is painting this picture, you know, someone has snuck away with this treasure thing into this field intentionally when no one else could see, and then they've, you know, they dug a hole or they've put it somewhere where it's not in plain sight, right? Because if you have a treasure, mo most of us would agree with this, if you have a treasure, 
you guard, you pay attention to what you're doing with treasure and you don't just leave it out in the open. Are you with me with that? How many of you leave your wallet on your front porch? No, you don't do it because it's a treasure to you. You take care of that. Those of you with little kids, they are a treasure to you most of the time. <laughs> right? And so if I were to ask you today, hey, where's your, where's your four-year-old? You wouldn't go, I don't know. Just open the door and let him out. So you would never do that because you're intentional with things that are of great value. And the reality is, this might be new to uh, some of you, the reality is God is very intentional with things of great value. He's intentional with things of great value. <clears throat> So I would submit to you that this treasure that's in a field, the gentleman who found it did a little bit more to see it than other people that may have been wandering through the field. You can write this in. Most spiritual treasure isn't obviously visible. So I would imagine when this gentleman we're saying is walking through the field, the treasure box is not sitting on a stump up for everyone to see. So he, he I, you know, I imagine it this way. We don't know what was exactly what was in Jesus' mind. But he would be looking more intentionally. He might see like a bump in the turf. Like, well, it looks like something's buried over there. Or, or maybe the top of a box. Maybe it had been buried there for a while. And like, it's just like the top of this box. And then he would go over, right? And have a little more, hmm, and get his fingers dirty. And like, I wonder what that is, right? Because he ends up digging it up and then burying it again. It's just this extra energy or effort if you're going to find the treasure. Some examples of people who found treasure in the Bible, not physical treasure. But there's, an, there's a story in Matthew 17 where a few of the disciples get to see Jesus transformed into a, a more eternal image. They get to experience the presence of God. They get to see Moses and Elijah, who had already passed away, come back to life. And they have this, com it's like this big God conference call. But to get, and they get to watch it happen. And there are only three gentlemen that got to watch it happen. But for them to be the people who got to see it, they had to, the Bible says that they had to go climb a mountain Jesus led them up a high mountain, so they got to climb a mountain by themselves. They had to go do something that not everybody else was doing to experience it. In Luke 19, there's a story of a man named Zacchaeus who gets to have Jesus come to his house, and his life gets transformed. But part of the story is while everybody else was on the ground, he climbed a tree to see Jesus. It's the extra effort. Sometimes it's a lot of effort. In Mark chapter 8, verse 2, it describes a group of people that had encounters with Jesus, got to hear his teaching, probably got to see many miracles, and Jesus describes them. He says, they have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Jesus is afraid if he sends them home that they will faint on the way home. So how long has that been since they've had something to eat? For some of you, you're thinking, two and a half hours, I would think, right? Because we eat. These people have spent, when was the last time you spent three days? I'm asking myself, when was the last time I spent three days in intentional pursuit of God, and I was so intentional about pursuing God that I gave up food to do it? That's the kind of thing that will open up new doors, spiritual treasures in your life. I wonder how many of those people who had these probably phenomenal encounters with Jesus Christ, teachings and hope and, the, and miracles that they would see or experience, they would go back to their little community, probably filled with life and, and stories. And I wonder how many people thought, gosh, well, why, don't, why doesn't God ever do that in my life? And part of the picture, part of the picture is, it's because you stayed home while we went out to did the extra. little theology for you. You can write this down if you'd like. 
God sent Jesus to bring the goods, <clears throat> but we may have to hunt a little. Or a lot, sometimes. So to bring it into the room, think of that area of your life that you would love to have this amazing new spiritual discovery. It'll change your life if you can get it. And then the question is, when was the last time I really hunted? I could change the question into a challenge, like go hunt for it. Set aside a day or two. Or an hour. how about we set aside an hour to pray? Or a week every morning to pray the, pray the same prayer. Or get godly counsel. How about instead of reading multiple, multiple blogs on the topic, we read the Bible to figure out what God might want us to do? Some of you are like, what? No, really? What if we did that? Did you know that Google and God are not the same thing? <laughs> did you know that? Some of you are like, you're kidding. No. And you know, I think there's a challenge in our culture right now because we have so much access to easier ideas and ways to get more information. So it's just so easy to go, oh gosh, I wish I knew, I wish I had this, and we just, you know, Google it. How about if we godded it? <laughs> but what if we said, okay, I'm not going to Google it. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, God, I'm not going to, does that make sense? I wonder whether God, first of all, he'd go, oh, I'm amazed that you didn't Google it before you came to me. But the treasure, the, the key to the treasures of life, folks, have way more to do with God than, than some of the very simple ideas that we're pursuing. And so, go after God. So finding spiritual ta treasure, <clears throat> I was going to, I misspeak a lot, don't I? Like, I blah, blah, blah. You, someone's probably t taking count. How many times will we mumble his words today? I almost said, finding spiritual tasers. Ta yeah, ta a taser. What's a spirit? Forget it. Let's move on. You got to dig around. Second idea is finding spiritual treasures takes significantly letting go. Letting go. And uh, in both the guy who finds the treasure... And the pearl hunter, neither one of them, this might, you may not have noticed this, this was newer to me, neither one of them just get to find this thing of great value and bring it into their life. Did you notice? Both of them, so the treasure, he, has to, he buries it again and he has to go sell all of the stuff that he has so that he can get the treasure that he wants. The pearl guy has to go sell all his stuff because he's got this opportunity. Just because it's an opportunity, it doesn't mean that it's a possession. Both of them have to do something more to get it, right? In the verses, maybe they've been up on the screen. The guy goes and hides the treasure again, and then in his joy sold all he had and bought the field, in the same way with the pearl. So, here is some important understanding about how treasure from God works. God, here you can fill in a couple words here. God does not say you can have it all. God says you can trade up. That's the way it works. He doesn't say you can have, have it all from this parable. You can trade up. And I was going to talk about sacrifice here, but there is no indication that these individuals feel like they're sacrificing to get the new thing. The one actually says, in his joy, he went and sold everything he had to go buy the field. So there's no indication that he was like, well, I guess it's treasure. 
I'm going to have to get rid of what I have now. That's not the way it would have happened. So I imagine him, you know, running home to Trudy, his wife. That's her name. <laughs> Made that up. But I, you know, running with joy. You know, Trudy, put out the garage sale sign. Get it all in the front yard, baby. Right? Get out the tags and, and make me an... There's no indication of wah, wah. I guess I'm going to have to give up my stuff to get... That's because the treasure is so much better than anything he has at the time. Same way with the pearl. I don't, I don't imagine the pearl guy having a sad moment as he observed all of his old pearls that are not as valuable as the new pearl he wants to get. Oh, pearls. <laughs> I remember when I bought you... I've loved you. There's none of that. He's just, you unload the stuff you have because the new stuff is just surpasses it all. We have a God story we're going to interject here. And it's just a good testimony. But in the midst of it, will you notice the... The, the, the requirement of giving up to receive the better thing that God has for this young lady's life. Her name is Clara. Watch this. I was very depressed. I was very broken. I was hurt and I was angry um, at the world. I was living a life full of such deception and such lies that I had convinced myself and everyone around me that I was happy and that I was content with what, where I was. Um, but the truth was, deep down inside, that that wasn't the truth. I would wake up and I would be angry and upset and I didn't know why. And I wouldn't want to talk to anyone around me. I would just want to go to work, you know, get paid and then come home and not do anything. So a year ago, the Lord convicted me. And he, he looked at all these things that I was placing in front of him. And he looked at the relationship that I was in and he said, nope, you're gonna have to let that go. And, which was a shock. <laughs> He's like, no, you're gonna let that go. And then he looked at my job that I was in and he said, yeah, you're gonna, you have to let that go too. And then he looked at my major at school and he said, you have to let that go. And essentially he was telling me I had to let go of what I, what I knew. And I did let it all go. I did because I was very hopeless. And a week after I had let go of those three main things, but also a lot of other, a lot of other things, um, I got a call from the church to intern in children's ministry. Of course, I, I said yes to that because obviously it was Jesus. And then the day after that, I got a call from the music studio I was, I am currently teaching at for a job. And I also switched my major. So this all happened a week after and it was crazy, and it was cool, and it was overwhelming, and it was all Jesus. There is no other way that it could have been anything else but Jesus. I strayed for, for years and years of my life, but instead of putting me to shame and making me feel guilty for the life of sin that I was living, he just opened his arms to me and he, he gave me what he had waiting for me. He said, thank you for coming home to me. Here, here's what I have for you. I wanna emphasize how good Jesus is and what he does. Like he saves, he restores, he redeems, he heals my, he healed my brokenness. He made me whole again. Like that's what he does and he, he loves us and he's good. And it's so crazy and he doesn't withhold that from us. Like when we turn to him, when we accept him as our savior, he gives those things to us. And it is, it's, it's just nuts. I can't even describe it. Yeah, it's a great story, a great testimony. <clears throat> um, several good things in the testimony. Uh, but one of the realities was the reality of letting go of what she had to get what God wanted her to have. But I like it because also what God had for her was way better. Last fill in the blank. Holding on too tightly to the now keeps us from experiencing the next. 
spiritual necessity for us to have a willingness to give up what we have for God to bring us the valuables to come. So we're going to uh, close our time with a group prayer.